Notre Dame fans, we are back. Round two today. We had our mailbag earlier today, and tonight we are going to have our Notre Dame Pro Day recap and analysis. I am joined by that guy over there. It's Ryan Roberts. From, you can find him at, at Rise and Draft on Twitter. That guy over there is Sean Davis. Both of our, our recruiting analysts, but the nice thing is I didn't hire recruiting people that don't know football, that just know how to make phone calls. I want to. If you're going to work at hours breakdown, you've got to know football. And these guys know football. So I was like, well, I can't be at Pro Day. So who better to have there than my guys? So uh, Sean and Ryan were both there. We've got all the results. We're going to go over the results as we kind of go player by player. Uh, We're going to talk about what those results meant. You know, did they help? Did they hurt? All that different stuff. And uh, and guys, let's kind of get started with this was, I believe, both of your first times in the indoor facility, correct? Neither one of you have been in the indoor facility uh, since it opened. I know it was Ryan's. I think, Sean, this was your first two guys. What did you think of the new indoor facility? It's a little bit different than the old, uh, you know, in the back of the Goog, right? In the old workout center that Lou Holtz used to use for practices, indoor practices. <laughs> I mean, it was it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was um... – I mean, obviously on a day like today that it was a little bit rainy, a little bit dreary. There's some guys that don't really have the option, you know, to be outdoors or indoors. And Notre Dame certainly has a beautiful practice facility indoors there. It's uh, it's really nice. Yeah, Brian, I was sharing with uh, Ryan that my short days of playing football were on a terrible turf with a crown in the middle of the field. Turf and a crown? Yes. So – when I walked onto the turf, I said, this feels like pillows beneath my feet. <laughs> and I probably would have played a little bit longer if I could play on this. <laughs> but the facility is absolutely yeah. amazing, top notch. Yeah, no doubt about it. And there were 30 NFL teams in attendance today. Uh, according to some tweets that I saw, I believe that I saw the only two teams that didn't have uh, didn't have somebody there were the Seahawks. And the Falcons, I believe. But I think both of them have been in contact. Kyle Hamilton also mentioned both of them as teams that have talked to him. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of those things where he might be the only guy that they're looking at and they don't need to see, uh, you know, anything else from those guys. So 30 of the 32 teams were there, had some GMs there, had some head coaches there, which was pretty cool. And of course, the top guy that they were there to see was Kyle Hamilton. And obviously Kyle had uh, wanted to make up for his for his NFL scouting combine results. So Kyle ran a four, five, nine at the NFL scouting combine had very good jumping numbers. Ryan uh, today, he only did the 40 yard dash jumped down to four five, six. And talk to me about what you saw and uh, talk to me about, you know, does this move the needle at all? Does this quiet concerns that some people had, or is it just kind of, if you were worried about his combine, you're going to be worried about this and you're probably looking at the wrong things. I don't think it really quieted concerns per se when you really think about it. I mean, four, five, six at a pro day comparative to four, five, nine at official time at a, at a, at the combine is relatively the same, right? Like, and I mean, I personally had him, you know, in the four, six low on my, on my watch. So I, I it didn't really remedy any of the concerns in my opinion, but I really, again, after you saw the explosive numbers of the combine, you saw the movement, you saw the movement drills in terms of on field. I think you're pretty comfortable with Kyle Hamilton, what he is, right? And how often are safeties going to be running 40 yards in a straight line? Like he's a rangy guy. He's shown it on film. He's got great film. And I think the best thing that he did outside of it is he's incredibly well-spoken afterwards. You know, he handled the interview process because people were flocking to him and, you know, we're all kind of throwing uh you know, throwing phones in his face and getting, getting our quotes and all that good stuff. But he handles that like a champ and he stuck, stuck around until the end cheering on his guys. And you kind of heard him loud and clear and, so I think he I think he answered um, all the things that you needed to see from him from a leadership perspective mm-hmm. and all those good things. But I, I don't think that he per se stopped the concern from the 40 time. I mean, right. it just is what he is. He's not a great tester of the 40 for whatever reason, even though he told the media that he'd been testing. And he expected to run around a 447 during this process because that's kind of he's got he, a quick watch at his uh, facility, wherever he's working. Apparently, man, that, those Exos clocks need to be checked a little bit. Man. Yeah, some I might calibrations need to, go, need to be happening yeah, over at that place. Has to be. So obviously, he didn't perform quite up to his what his standards were from the from the uh, pre testing situation. But you know, I, I still think that again, like we always talk about it, Kyle Hamilton's not getting out of the top ten right. in my opinion. I, I would he be better, very shocked. He better not. Can. 
he but I got I got to point this out though real quick. This is one of the reasons I love Irish Breakdown in the community app. Katie Kevers is talking about we got two shows in one day. Let's go. Wow, her husband John is out getting dinner. So, so he's on his way. He's watching while on his way home. She's at home watching. Love this community so much. Sean, I think for me, you know, the 40 times not great, but but Ryan had an article after the combine pointing out how many great NFL safeties were running mid to high four fives and four sixes. It's about popping on the tape and being like, has range ever been a question for you for Kyle Hamilton? Answer no. I think at this point in time, if if you are unless you're a team that's here's why I'm concerned he may fall out of the top 10. Just hear me out, Ryan. He shouldn't. But there's a reason the same teams keep picking in the top 10 every year. We're hearing all these NFL analysts talking about how Trayvon Walker now might go number one overall. That's why certain teams pick in the top 10 every year because you're going to go with the combine results over film. If you think Trayvon Walker is a better football player than Kyle Hamilton, you're only you're only doing a stopwatch. You're, and that's why your team sucks all the time because you keep taking Vernon Golston instead of guys that actually can play football, Right. And so I think, Sean, that would be the only thing that could maybe knock him out. I think the only real concern I have for Kyle is just, you know, just missed time because of injuries. He's had, you know, injuries that have cost him games in each of the last two years, uh, was not 100% for the remainder of the season. But, man, Sean, after a while, if you can't watch the film, and there's a lot of it, and be like, this dude's really, really good, and you maybe got to find something else to do with your career. And I think this is something – Kyle Hamilton is very sure who, who he is as a young man, and he's very sure of whom he is as an athlete. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, he said he's the best player in the draft. He firmly believes that. He's always believed that. And I don't think what happened today or what happened at the Combine in Indianapolis swayed or deterred him in one direction opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to. And that's the way it's going to settle with teams as he meets with them individually. Mm -hmm. And he goes to individual workouts. So, like you said, and like Ryan pointed out, you watch the tape, and that's the type of kid you see on tape, and the tape doesn't lie. Now, if you feel like that four, five, six, or what you saw in the four, five, nine in Indianapolis doesn't line up with what you're watching on film, then you take the chance on missing out on a generational right. player being on the defensive side of the ball, and that's just a chance and a risk that you're going to have to answer for with your right. job. There's about 28 NFL teams that probably look back and wish they would have taken Harrison Smith. Yes. In, in the in, in the 2012 Absolutely. NFL draft. Absolutely. And he ran a what a four five four. Yeah. Now Harrison had some movement numbers that were a lot better than Kyle's, but Kyle's explosive numbers were better than Harrison's. You know what I mean? And so yeah. at the end of the day, you gotta look at the you gotta look at the film. And of course, Kyle's film is excellent. I mean, I don't care what you think of Kyle history and injury history, what you think about the fact that he did or didn't quit on uh, the one thing we should all be able to agree on is the film is outstanding. And it has been whenever he's been on the field, he's been really, really good. Another player, guys, today that that I think helped himself, at least that's my opinion, but I want to hear from you guys that were there working out, is Kyron Williams. Now, Kyron, obviously, a lot was made of the 465 at the uh, NFL scouting combine, and he didn't get a chance to do the movement drills, Ryan, because the, basically I call it a boycott. All the running backs boycotted the movement drills because of the just the absurdity of how that schedule was. He ran a 4-1-9 in the pro shuttle, mm -hmm. which is the 20-yard. That would have tied for eighth at last year's NFL scouting combine mm -hmm. among running backs, and he ran a 6-9-4, which would have tied for ninth at last year's NFL scouting combine. I don't think Notre Dame has necessarily a fast track relative to kind of guys haven't made big jumps in the last couple of years at Notre Dame at the pro days compared to what they did at the combine. They've been kind of on pace or sometimes even a little bit slower. So I think those numbers are pretty good. I feel like testing wise, at least Ryan, I feel like Kyron Williams certainly helped himself today. And he was five pounds heavier at 199 than he was yes. at the scouting combine as well, which I thought was very important. And you've talked a lot yeah. about the weight at the 40 time plus what weight are you running it at? Yeah, man, it's that 200 pound threshold for running backs like that can separate guys between being high volume carriers and being guys that are situational pass catchers. They're down type backs. Right. So um, I like that he came in a little heavier. And I mean, across the board, Brian, I agree. I think that every I, I think that those, you know, you like you said, the, the six, nine, four, three cone, the, the four, one, nine short show. They're both solid numbers. I don't think they're they're not spectacular but they're solid they're nothing that's a, that alarms you and i mentioned a second ago about how kyle hamilton improved from a four five nine to a four five six which is not substantial right like it's not huge movement comparing a combine to a pro day 
Well, going from four six five to four five four is a massive improvement. So I want to chalk it up personally, just looking at that time and say Kyron just didn't have a great day. Like it just was not a great yeah. workout. Four five four is much more what I see on film with Kyron Williams. He's not a burner, right. but he's not deficient in speed either. Right. Like he, can, he doesn't he move can, like a four seven guy, Ryan. No. Which no, is basically can, what his first time was at at the thing. Exactly. And he he can create some explosive plays. And then the best part of it is is that despite the fact that he had a really good workout in, in those areas and, and retesting in the 40, the be- best thing that Kyron Williams does is when he's on the field, he's playing football. You saw him. I mean, he had one drop that would have been a really tough catch kind of down the field track in the football. But otherwise, I mean, every route that, Ky- that Kevin Austin was running, Kyron Williams was running too. He was running mm-hmm. deep down the field. He was running wheel routes. He was running, you know, posts. Like he was doing everything. He wasn't just running swings out of the backfield or little leaks. Like he was – running a substantial route tree, playing outside the numbers and running routes. And he looked very solid and just comfortable catching the football. So I thought it was a I thought it was a huge day for Kyron. I think there was a couple guys that you can argue had bigger days comparative because we just didn't have anything to really compare mm-hmm. it to. But the improvements that we saw from Kyron in that 40 time and the comfortability continually that we see him in the on-field drills, I think it's just kind of cementing again. He's a top five running back in this class. He's one of the better mm-hmm. running backs in this class. It's just a simple fact that he might not test as good as some guys, but right. when you turn on the film, you just have to trust your eyes with Kyron Williams. And Sean, in today's game, you cannot be, unless you're Derrick Henry and, and you run like he runs, you can't be a running back in today's NFL if you can't be effective in the pass game. And I don't even just mean catch the football. I mean the pass game, meaning – Catching the like Brian said, you know, catching the ball out of the backfield, obviously, but it's more about can you line up outside? Can they put you in ISOs? Can they do different things with you? Can you run routes once you get past the line of scrimmage? Can you pass block? And then day, Sean, you have to have that. And and there's no matter what you think of, you know, the forty time, which I think is silence now. I mean, this is the range that Kyron should have been. The the agility numbers were there. That shows up on film. Like that's what you see. And back Ryan, and I'll get back to you first, but I but Sean, that's the thing for me is. You have to have, Kyron is a modern running back in so many. I mean, yeah, I wish he was a little bit bigger, but Kyron is the modern running back. I mean, his game is what you want of a modern running back. And that four five four blows away what Ky- uh, Clyde Edwards Alaire ran at his LSU pro day, which was a four six flat, I believe. He's over over half a tenth, or over what it be like half a tenth, right? Or uh, I mean, that's that's a that's a significantly quicker play. five hundredths of a second. We'll keep it at five hundredths yeah. of a second. Yep. There you go. Yeah, five tenths, half five tenths would have been like a three nine. <laughs> but really, other than Kyle Hamilton, I was sitting next to Ryan. And I was like, "This is what we're here for." Mm-hmm. Like as Notre Dame fans, we know what Kyron's about to do. Like this mm-hmm. is set up for him, and he mentioned it when he was meeting with the press that the difference in his performance in Indianapolis and today is just the familiarity with the surroundings and him feeling comfortable. And he was like, "Yo, I feel comfortable." teammates were on the upper deck cheering them on cheering everybody on and he just felt like the stage was his and he took full advantage of it twisting catches down the field beautiful routes i know one thing lance taylor taught his running backs how to do this at the line of scrimmage i don't know about Mm -hmm. the previous wide receiver coach but lance taylor does a done good job at teaching releases and kyron williams was evidence of that very impressive with impressive with what he did on the field and like you said ryan the effort that it takes to go in and make a substantial change in your 40 time like he did shows that he put in the work and it's something to really, really be proud of. He should really go get a nice meal and take a really big nap tonight because mm-hmm. he put in a lot of work and made a lot of money, in my opinion, today. And Ryan, can, I I, say, can I say real quick, Brian, his, his also the, I think that my favorite thing about Kyron is that he just has an infectious personality, yeah. man. Like when you're an undersized running back, sometimes it's hard to quantify just the competitiveness that he has, and he has it in space. You, you don't often see an, an NFL caliber athlete that the, the media towers over. Exactly. <laughs> you know exactly. I mean? like, Ky- yeah. Kyron is that guy. Yeah, man. He he just exudes this confidence, and even when yeah. just answering questions, and he talked about, and someone asked him straight up, like, were you in, were you disappointed in your combine performance? And he's like, of course I was. I was very disappointed in my combine performance. I felt sorry for myself for about a day, and then I picked myself back up. I went back to Bomberito down in Florida, and I started working again. Like, mm-hmm. that's the only way I know how to do it. So right. I just really wanted to throw that out, man. It's like 
sometimes it's hard to quantify the character and the competitiveness mm-hmm. that some of these guys have because that's the make it or break it a lot of times. It's not the 40 time. It's not the it's not the the vertical all the time. Like, obviously, you want to be a good athlete, but some guys you just you can't teach it, man. Like, it's just there. And I think it's there for Kyron. Well, you can't be 5'9", a buck 99, run a 4.54 four, and have 28 and a half inch arms if you're not a super and, – and be as good as he was if you're not a super competitive guy. I mean, you just, you, you can't be. And Ryan, I wanted to ask you about the, the, so like a, a lot can be made of people say, well, you know, pro day, he had time to, you know, train for the 40 and, you know, you can't just chalk it up as a bad day because the numbers are what they are. But I, I actually disagree. I think scouts that are smart, and I think there are a lot of smart scouts, they're going to look at that and they're going to, they're going to know what you and I know and have talked about with the schedule that this kid was up at 4 a.m. and didn't get to run the 40 to like 7 p.m. Right. Like he's never going to be in that situation in a football game where he's up at 4 a.m. doing stuff all day. And then they got to play a, a, a game at Monday night. Like I think they're going to look at and say the the agility numbers that he showed today track with what you see on film. The four five four tracks with you see on film, which means he's not Chris Tyree. But if he gets a step, you're not going to catch him which is exactly what we saw from him in the NFL or in, in college football. So I think the fact that he did the agility numbers that he did to me combined with the workout and with the 40 show is, is going to make it a lot easier for him and his agent to tell people like, look, that was more on the NFL than it was Kyron. And Kyron is a littler guy. So, you know, some of these bigger yeah. guys maybe were able to handle that. Uh, but I, I think that's going to help only going to help his case when it comes down to the, the argument of who is that third, fourth back in this draft. Yeah, and I mean, Kyron talked about it a little bit, kind of the the combine scheduling and stuff, and he just basically said, like, it needs to change. And I agree with yeah. him, man. Like, it just really does need to change. But, like, as for your question, I mean, quite quite simply, man, it's, the ver- it's a verification process for this testing, right? Some people went to the combine, and – they watch Kyron Williams fill what they watch Kyron Williams run a four six five at 194 pounds, and they said, That's a red flag. I need to go mm-hmm. look at that film again. And then it, I believe, Brian, being the people that we are as film watchers, that they went back to the film. And I hope that they yeah. watched this film and they're like, No, I don't see four six five there. I see better right. than that. And then so right. then what happens is you come back to this setting and he runs maybe more in your minds what he ran before. So I think that this and that, was and that's the confirmation that you talked about. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. The verification confirmation is today. Like I right. think that people now are back on track and saying, no, that, that's what I saw. That's what I right. saw. And I'm going to trust that because he's a hard guy not to believe in. He's a very right. hard guy not to believe in. And I think that that's what you got today is the, a little impulse for more for the belief in Kyra Williams as a player and an athlete. So before we move too far on from Kyron, and uh, John Kievers had a question. How do Kyron's numbers compare to James White? Obviously, James White was from Wisconsin. James White was a fourth-round pick of the the 2014 NFL draft by the Patriots. Do you see Kyron's game as a James James White in the NFL? Let me first compare the numbers, Ryan and Sean. Mm -hmm. Both of you can take a crack at that if you want as far as comparing their games. James White was 5'9", 204 with 29 and a quarter inch arms, a very similar size to what Kyron was. Yep. He ran a four five seven, which is a little faster than Kyron. Thirty two inch vertical, which is right where Kyron was. One hundred fourteen mm-hmm. inch broad, which is about where Kyron was, if I remember correctly. I think Kyron might have been a little bit like just an inch or so less. He had a seven oh five three cone compared to Kyron's six nine four, and he had a four two shuttle, which is like right on par with Kyron's four one nine. So very similar, very similar size. Uh, body type and testing numbers for James White and Kyron Williams, and as we all know, James White's been a been a pretty pretty good football player in the, in the National Football League. Yeah, and it's a, it's a good baseline to be compared with like someone like that, right? Like if you're a, if you're a third down back and you're as good as James White, you're gonna be playing football in the NFL for a long time. Mm-hmm. I think I do think that Kyron has a little more early down ability than James yeah. White though, because James White's a glorified slot receiver, mm-hmm. outlet receiver, and he's very good at that. Yeah. But I, I I think that he's going to be somewhere in between. James White, Austin Eckler, somewhere in that ballpark, like so, probably split the difference a little bit. So I that's think that's a guy for the Chargers. Good. Yeah, guy for the Chargers. Chargers. Yeah, who's really a really dynamic receiver, kind of a right. smaller guy as well. Um, but I really think that he has a baseline of being a really good pass catching running mm-hmm. back. But I also think that he's just got a little more early down ability than right. a guy like James White. Just and real quick too, to your point about James White, James White is going into his ninth season with the Patriots. He's only rushed for twelve hundred seventy eight yards in his career, but he's caught three hundred eighty one passes for over three thousand yards. I yeah. think to your point, I could see Kyron having very similar numbers to that in the past game. 
I, I just like you. And I think another guy like if Philip Lindsay can be a thousand yard rusher in the NFL, Kyron Williams can be a thousand yard rusher in the NFL. I'm, I'm sorry. He's just a, a better football player. Sean, what are your thoughts on that? It's all about where he goes, Brian. Mm-hmm. It's going to be very important. James White was tremendously blessed to end up with Tom Brady, the <laughs> New England Patriots, mm-hmm. a team that's going to take out the best thing you do and make sure they take full advantage of it, of it on the football field. If Kyron can get to a team with a system that can do the same thing, he's going to have the same length of a career, very successful. And Ryan pointed it out as we were halfway through his workout. He was like, dude, at 190, 191, he's pretty much a slot receiver, mm-hmm. you know, in the NFL. And that's the type of weapon he can be in the passing game. Right. I'm sure he won't get down to that weight, but – the kid can play. Uh, right. You know, that's the one thing that stood out to me, Brian, just watching him up close and personal. Like, forget all of the questions. Forget all of the testing. When he steps in between the lines, what does he do? Right. And he produce. Yeah. And the young man is going to produce not only on this level. I believe in the right, uh, right situation he's going to produce at the next level as well. And comparing him, Austin Eckler was the guy you brought up. We, we went over James White's numbers. Uh, Austin Eckler was 5'8 eight and 5'8s. Just kind of a weird number to see. Uh, 198 pounds, so very similar body types. He ran a 448 and a 449, so faster. And, and that tracks with the explosives. He was a 40 and a half inch vertical and a 10 8 broad, which is where Kyron. But the, the movement numbers were identical, or Kyron was better. His pro shuttle was 428, Kyron was 419, and his three cone was 692, which is almost identical to Kyron's 694. So, and those are the numbers ultimately they're going to have a lot more to do with the running back success. It's those movement numbers because that's where most of your damage happens. The 40 is going to determine whether your 25 yard run turns into a 50 yard run, right? I mean, that's ultimately what it's what it's going to be determined by. So um the the body types, again, it just shows there are guys that can be that big that aren't four threes or four four ones that are pretty darn good football players in some way, shape, form, or fashion. So I think the fact that Kyron is projects, in my opinion, as a better runner, hopefully will be the thing that helps him get drafted before a guy like you know James White was drafted in, in regards to to that. Because obviously James White was at the end of the uh, uh end of the first round. Where was Austin? Was he a was he a, a he was UDFA. undrafted? He wasn't drafted. Okay. No. Yeah. So it just goes to show, you know, he, he came, he came from a small school, Western state. School. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he, I was reading it. He ran at Colorado's pro day. Like they didn't have their own pro day. <laughs> so uh, if he would have done that and played at Notre Dame, I think he probably would have been get picked, gotten picked a little bit higher. So guys, let's talk about some of the other testing numbers. We were going to talk about Jack Cohn first, but I want to talk about Jack at the end since he didn't test. We'll kind of stick with the guys that tested. Uh, Drew White is the guy for me, fellas, just looking at the numbers that I thought had the the best day of of the the group that doesn't include like the big names. I mean, you look at a four six seven, which was a little bit faster than what you had projected was the ideal number for him, right, Ryan? I think your projected ideal number was like around I, a four I, seven. I, I said four six five to four seven five. So, so he was at the bottom half five. of that, yep. right? And then you look at some of the other numbers. I mean, his vertical was. Let me find him here. I got Drew White here. Vertical was only 29 inches, which tracks with the 40, but his other numbers were impressive. He ran, mm-hmm. he, but even though he ran a 467, he ran a 1 6 flat, which was the fastest of all the Notre Dame players. Dante Vaughn and Kyron Williams were the next closest at 1 6 2. Now, that's a number like that 1 6 2 for Kyron that kind of shows that get off. Drew White's was a 1 6 flat. He had a 4 2 flat in the shuttle and he had a 6 9 in the three cone now just for context those both would have been the number one times at the combine this year amongst line inside linebackers off ball linebackers last year it would have been second and third or uh, third in the pro shuttle second in the three cone behind only baron browning at last year's combine when more guys did it so that just puts his movement numbers into, into play and it just we've always talked about he's a much better athlete than people realize Four six seven with those movement numbers and a one six because the one six to me the ten yard number for a linebacker is a, a middle an inside linebacker is way more important than a forty time. I think I think Drew White helped himself today. Not I mean I don't know if it's going to result in draft because of his size and his injury history, but I think some I think he's going to be a little bit more. Hey, let's look at that guy 
uh, when it comes to the if if the bottom of the draft or in the undrafted where there may be a little competition because that's the kind of kid you talk talking about those numbers those are those are special team standout numbers in my opinion like hey that's a guy that we can get to run down on some kickoffs and cover some punts because this kid can move and this kid's got some quickness and some ability so I thought Drew White really helped himself today what say you Sean? Basically, you're saying he's going to be drafted by the San Diego Chargers. <laughs> I mean, they they <laughs> do pick like, Notre Dame guys to play <laughs> special teams. That is true. That is true. Does the same is that the same guy? Is it the same guy that's been there? Or do they have a new leadership now? Oh, I'm man, not. I'm not sure. Guy. Yeah. Okay. It's the same so guy. And, and look, yeah. we both sat there and we thought, you know what? Yeah, he's a guy, and mm-hmm. we kind of expected him to have a really good day. He actually surpassed what I thought he would do from a number standpoint. You mm-hmm. just talked about the 10 split. But we knew that, right? Mm-hmm. Just from watching his film. And I pointed out to Ryan the first time he stepped in for Drew Tranquil, Tranquil against Navy. It was just like, yo, this kid, he can play. Yeah. Like, he's yeah. good. And he kept surpassing our thoughts because remember, he jumped in front of a lot of other guys at that position to back yeah. up Drew Tranquil. And mm-hmm. that was the shot. And for him to be productive. And that's another thing. Like Ryan would tell you, it's probably unfair, but you can tell the difference in applause for certain guys. Mm-hmm. And Drew was one of those guys that got a bigger round of applause. With his teammates workouts. love him. Oh, yeah. man. They love him. And that stood out to me. So you talk about that leadership and the attractive numbers that he put forth today. An NFL team can definitely fall in love with that. And he's definitely the type of kid that once he gets in front of those teams and they have a chance to meet with them, they're mm-hmm. definitely going to fall in love with them one-on-one. Right. So, I, well, and he's what, a two-time captain at Notre Dame, correct? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It doesn't happen a whole lot. And this is where the this is where the comparisons to Joe Schmidt, we always were like, no, you can't compare him to Joe Schmidt because Joe was a great kid and a smart kid and a great leader, but Joe was not the athlete that you needed there. Drew's an athlete. Now, I, again, I think he doesn't have really long arms. I mean, he, he you know, 30 and one eighth is actually, that's actually a little better than I thought it was going to be. The 30 and an eighth is short, but it's better than I thought it was going to be, to be completely honest with you. And the wingspan was 73, which uh, in five eighths, which I thought was a little bit better than I, than I thought. I, that's what I was concerned. He was going to have these like little like dinosaur arms when he measures in. But Ryan, I want to read something to you. This is, was written today by the recruiting uh, director at Irish Breakdown. This was written yesterday. Um, if you don't know, that's him. Uh, this is about Drew White. He said he will garner an opportunity as a priority free agent just co- uh, just off of the name recognition and a, and a resume as a player. If White wants to a real chance to stick, however, he will have to bring some movement skills to warrant upside as a special teamer and situational player. The pro day is a huge test for him. Then you wrote, these are the ideal numbers for Drew White to have if he wants to get there. And for the, the short shuttle, you ran, you put 4-2 to 4-3, you ran a 4-2. For the three cone drill, you ran six nine to seven one. He ran a six nine, so he mm-hmm. literally had the best of that that area. So, I mean, to what you wrote, it's a huge test for him. I'd say Drew passed it with flying colors. He did, he did, and I mean, I also put in that article that things, two things that you don't want to be is you don't want to be undersized and not athletic. And mm-hmm. he is undersized. Like, let's call it what it is. There's Six nothing foot. you can do about that. It can't do anything about that. That is that's a part of the deal. Six foot, two eighths, two hundred twenty nine pounds. Like you said, he's got a small, he's got short arms, he's got a smaller wingspan. Like those are the realities. But also the reality is that he's a four six athlete mm-hmm. that mo- that is has quickness to him and has short areas of explosiveness. So he gave himself a chance. He was going to get an opportunity. <clears throat> excuse me, most likely as a UDFA after the draft, but he is only. I, I think affirmed what my, my feelings was is the fact that I thought he was a good athlete on film. That's why I kind of put those numbers to his name and he is going to get an opportunity because he can make up for the, he can overcompensate with his athleticism for the lack of length that he has as a football player. Drew White's going to be in a camp next year from there. It's about taking advantage of the special right. teams opportunities and taking advantage of really digging into the playbook and getting right. with the coaches and doing all that type of stuff. So we'll see what happens with that. But right. right now, Drew White did about as well as he possibly could right. have at the event outside of the, the vertical. But yeah. yeah, and and you mentioned the weight 229. I thought that was significant as well. Cause I mean, I, I was, you know, some of these kids will lose, like some of these kids will lose weight to test well and think that hey, I ran this number in the NFL. I was like, well, yeah, but you did it at 218. You can't play at 218. 
The fact that he came in almost a 230 uh, to me and still ran that way, he's the kind of kid that you start getting to like round six, special teams coaches are starting to pound on the table. You know, I got to get this guy. I got to get this guy. Please give me this guy. And that's how you find some of these sixth and seventh round picks is you'll, it'll be some coach stands on the table late in the draft and says, I want this guy. And I could see some special teams coach somewhere watching the film. And again, Drew has a special teams background. He's played special teams in their name saying, hey, you see this six foot three, 230 pound you know, kid on special teams in their name named Bo Bauer who just runs it. He couldn't beat that this kid out in three years. He couldn't beat this kid out. And you're going to have two coaches that I think teams respect in Clark Lee and 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 um, uh, Marcus Freeman that are both going to sit there and say, you know, th- this kid is special. This kid's got leadership. This kid's got character. But this kid's athletic and this kid can play. And and but none of that means a hill of beans if he goes out there and runs a you know a four four in the shuttle and a seven two in the three cone and and he's 221 pounds. And so uh, big big day for him. Somebody else that I thought helped himself, Kurt Heinisch. And Kurt Heinisch showed up, and here's here's the first thing that impacted, guys. He was over 6'2", which we expected. He was 302 pounds. His arms were a little bit longer than I thought, although still short, but 32 and an eighth. A little, actually, a little longer than I thought they might be. Uh, 75 and an eighth inch wingspan, which is the same as Kane Madden. Uh, and he, but he had 28-inch uh, vertical, which is not bad. But his movement numbers, he ran a 496, which for a 302 pounder to get sub five flat uh, is pretty good. Ran a 446 in the pro shuttle and a three cone. Ryan, you had him down in the uh, ideal numbers. Mm-hmm. You said he needed at least 28 inches in the vertical. He got to 28. He said he needed at least a nine inch broad jump. Wasn't quite there. He was at 88. Short shuttle, you said 43 to 44. He got in there. The three cone, you said he needed to be from a seven three to a seven five, and he was a seven two nine. Mm-hmm. So he was actually came right under. And he did that at 302 pounds. And you said in there, you know, he you had him somewhere in the 285 to 292 range, which is what he was at Notre Dame. He came yeah. in about five to ten pounds heavier than he was at Notre Dame and still put up those numbers. I gotta think, plus again, two-year captain, five-year player, everyone's gonna rave about his work ethic and his attitude. I think Kurt Heinrich helped himself today, guys. What do you think, Ryan? Yeah, no, he he absolutely did. I I, I was I think we were kind of text exchanging the other day. I told you, like I, I have heard that he's going to test better than maybe people kind of anticipate, and even better mm-hmm. than I thought. I mean, first and foremost, the met. I mean, the weigh in was a huge winner because, like you said, playing over three hundred pounds that's huge. But also that I mean, that wingspan is significantly longer than I thought it was going to be. I thought he was just going to be this stubby dude. I expected the weight, the bench press to be really good, which it was. He did the most reps of anybody. Well, he still did the most reps, Brian. Still did the most reps of anybody. I mean, he had some short arm reps in there, guys. Let's be honest about that, right? He had some reps at the combine. They're not counting. But let's just say that, I mean, it's still at least 25 if you negated some of those, right? Like, yep. You know, but he was moving them. I mean, he was putting them up and putting them down. He was actually going a little bit too fast, I thought. Yeah. Um, but yeah, still 31 is what the number that Notre Dame gave today was on the, the bench press. I'm sorry, I just I yeah. saw that video and I was like, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. But still, he's a strong kid. And but that's gonna show up on film. I mean, you're gonna see mm-hmm. that strength on film. Sorry, Ryan. I just yeah. no, 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 you're I fine. Just, you're fine, you know. I just it's 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 context, man. It's context. It's it's. I mean, either way, he checked the box in that area. Mm-hmm. Four nine six for three hundred plus pounds is a really good number. Yeah. Like that's a really phenomenal number. What even better number? Let's compare real quick. One seven two ten yard split. Kyle Hamilton for comparison had a one six eight. So he mm-hmm. was almost as fast in the ten yard split as Kyle Hamilton. Kurt has this reputation, and it's fair that he's kind of this lunch pail blue collar dude who's just knows and. It's fair because that's the role that he plays in Notre mm-hmm. Dame. But he warned himself more opportunity today because he kind of said, but guys, I might just be a slightly better athlete than you might anticipate. Right. I might There might be a little more there. I want to interject on this, Ryan, because people talked about Jordan Davis and the ridiculous 40 time he had and all that. He had also had a 168 in the 10 yard split, which again, Kurtz isn't that far behind what people were saying was just a just a, a outrageous 10 yard split time. But yeah, to your point, he definitely showed himself that he's a better at. He's not just like you said, he is a lunch pail guy, but he's a lunch pail guy that has some quickness that puts him like athletically, he's checking out with a lot with with a lot of guys that people are gonna be drafting. 
And I think, and again, I'm going to say it again, to do it at 302 pounds was the key. That was the key for Kurt, to show up bigger than you've been at Notre Dame and still move like that, Sean. You know, you look at him now, you say, boy, I'm, I'm going to start kind of paying attention. We get to like round six, five, six. I got to think I'm going to start paying attention to see if Kurt's name is going to get called. He's a coach's delight. And I, I remember, I think I pointed out to you that he reminds me of someone I've had an opportunity to get to know a John Jerkovich who spent seven years playing with the Green Bay Packers and was best friends with Reggie, Reggie White. And he strikes me as that type of guy. He's similar to Drew White. Like every time he did something, the applause was just like mm -hmm. deafening. <laughs> and mm -hmm. everybody could just tell his teammates love him. He's infectious. You were the one that brought me around on Kurt Heinish about a year ago. And you just pointed out some things about his game. And finally, I came around and said, you know what? This kid is good. This kid is really good. And I was, I almost felt like as a fan for a second, like I'm there doing a job. But as a fan, <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there and I almost wanted to stand up and clap. Mm -hmm. For guys like Kirk Heinrich, right. who, like Brian said, they get put in this box and they get an opportunity to prove that, no, I'm a little bit better than you think right and that's what Kurt Heinz did today and hopefully those NFL teams took a look and they'll see a guy that can be a seven to eight year veteran in the right. NFL show leadership do his job along the defensive front might not be a starter but he'll definitely be a rotational player and he's going to be very serviceable on the next level and at least during half of his Notre Dame career he was dealing with a situation where his father who he's very close with was battling cancer I mean, so he did it while there was stuff going on. I mean, it wasn't just like life was perfect and everything went perfect for Kurt Heinish. So uh, love, love to see that because, you you know, you always want Notre Dame guys to do well, but there's also some guys, I mean, look, yeah, we're professionals. We have a job to do, but there's some guys you're like, man, I, I hope that kid makes it because he's just a great kid. I, I hope Drew White, with everything he's had to overcome, uh, mm -hmm. with Kurt Heinish and everything he's dealt with and, the, and what they meant to the team, Hey, both of those guys committed before the 2016 season. They were both commits before that season started, and they were two of those kids that stuck it through that three, and, and that's what makes it so crazy, like how long ago it was, how long they've been in the program, right? But also, it wasn't that long ago that this thing turned around. They were members of the 2017 class, but they were early commits. They committed the summer before the 2016 season, and when other players started jumping ship, when they went through that 4-8 and eight campaign, those two guys stuck with it and stayed with Notre Dame. And 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 Drew White's case did so with an incredibly impressive offer list. If you if you think Kurt Heinz or Drew White was some nobody recruit, go look at his offer list at St. Thomas Aquinas and go yeah. watch that game he had in high school against Bishop Gorman when he had 19 tackles on national television. Drew White's a good football player, and I don't think he's ever gotten enough credit for that. Now, are there improvements in Notre Dame can and hopefully can make down the road? Do they got to get better there? Yeah, they do. But Drew White's going to end his career with over 20 tackles for loss, a couple hundred tackles. It's a kid. This is the kind of kid you always say, look, yeah, I'm glad he came. He played at my school, you know, if you're a mm -hmm. fan. So he certainly helped himself. Uh, Myron Tungvaloa, guys, uh, did not, I don't think, really help himself beyond what he had done at the Combine. He, uh, I'm looking at the different numbers, obviously checked in at 270 pounds, 33-inch arms, which is not bad, uh, 79 and uh, 4 eighths. <laughs> Four eights. That's a half. I'm sorry, NFL people. That's a half. Everything's it, to the eighth of an yeah, inch. Brian. I know. It's so dumb. <laughs> um, this is why kids can't do math. One of the many reasons. Uh, improved his vertical only by a half of an inch. Uh, ran mm -hmm. a seven two nine in the three cone, uh, which is the same as Kurt Heinish, and then ran a four seven in the pro shuttle. I didn't see him run it. I don't know if you guys saw him run it. If he slipped, but I'm hoping he did because that was uh that was not the kind of numbers that you would want from from Myra Tungvalu Mosa. Now I, I think that I think the three cone was fine. Like for me, I, I saw the seven two nine. I'm just like that's that's fine. Like for what he is as a 270 pound base end who has played worked inside a ton. I'm like okay, that's cool. Four seven short shuttle is not great, I, and mm -hmm. I did not see him run it. So like I don't have a comment. And he only ran it once. Perfect reps. That was my thing. Like that's what makes me think that. I don't know. Maybe yeah. he fell or who knows or tweak something know. maybe because I mean there's. Yeah. I have to think with the competitor that he is that he wouldn't be okay with that time. Right? right. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, that part definitely didn't help him, uh, but like I said, I think there was one positive to the, I think the three cone was good enough and people are going to say, okay, he can play 
on the edge in a, in a large variety of snap or a larger variety of snaps and work inside a little bit. Cause I went into the event and was like, Oh man, is he a tweener? Is he a hybrid or is he a tweener? You don't want to be a tweener. You don't want to be, you want to be a hybrid defender. I think he maybe has quiet that concern a little mm-hmm. bit, but it's still, it's going to be a tough projection for him, man. Like it yeah. really is. I'm, I'm, not worried, but I'm interested to see what kind of teams. Because if, if it's like a New England Patriots that he ends up with at the end of the draft, or as a UDFA, like a, a a very versatile front, then I would be I would be very happy with it. But I think that you need a little creativity with a guy like a Kurt, uh, mm-hmm. like a guy like a Myron Tagovailoa Amosa. If I yeah. can talk, that'd be great. Yep. I want to make a comment here real quick from David Solomon. He says, I can't help remembering Tavon Coney tested second only to Devin Bush at the Combine. Devin was a top 10 pick. Tavon went undrafted. Hope someone takes a chance on Drew. That is not correct, David. Uh, Tavon Coney did not work out at the NFL Scouting Combine. He only worked out at Notre Dame, and he ran a 4.74 at Notre Dame. You're thinking of Drew mm-hmm. Tranquil. Drew Tranquil had a great testing at the Combine. He was a fourth-round NFL draft pick and is a starting linebacker in the National Football League. So, uh, I just want to make sure that you were clear on that. It was not Tavon Coney who had it, and Tavon did not have a good pro day. I was there at Tavon's pro day, and it was not good. Uh, Drew Tranquil is the one who had the numbers. And just for context purpose, purposes to compare them to Drew White, Tavon ran a 4.74 in the 40 and had a 1.75 10-yard split compared to 1.6 flat for Drew White. Tavon had a 32 and Tavon was 234 pounds. So he was only five pounds bigger than Drew. He had a 4.45 in the 20 yard shuttle, which is slow for a linebacker. And he ran a 7.33 in the three cone drill, which is incredibly, that's slower than Kurt Heinish and Myron Tungvaloa Mosa. So, no, Tavon Coney did not have a great test. He went undrafted because he had bad numbers and he had some other issues that are not related to football. But uh, he was not a very athletic player. Ryan and I have shared the story of the zigzag drill that was that he the zigzag drill he did, which wasn't supposed to be a zigzag drill. Uh, and Drew Tranquil was the one that ran the four five eight, uh, those different things. So you're 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 con- confusing him with somebody else. And Drew Tranquil, when healthy, has been a a pretty good NFL football player so far. Would you agree with that, Ryan? Yeah, man, I love Drew. I love Drew coming out, and he's been a very serviceable, solid football player for the Chargers. Mm-hmm. His thing is always just going to be durability, right? Right. It's, it's hurt him. It's hurt him a little bit at the Chargers yeah. too, unfortunately. But he's he's a good football player. He's on the field, always has been. And just so for comparison's sake, Drew checked in at uh, at the uh, combine at two hundred and let me see here, trying to find his numbers. He was two hundred and thirty four pounds. He ran a four five seven, which is faster than Drew. We had a 414 in the shuttle, which is faster than Drew, but not by a ton. And he ran a 694 in the shuttle when three cone, which is almost identical to Drew's. Uh, and he had a 159 in the in the 10 yard split, which is just slightly better than Drew. So uh, Drew White's. So very, very comparable numbers, 31 and a half inch arms. Drew White's 30 and an eighth. And ultimately, that's going to be the thing that's going to make Drew White. Drew White's a special teams guy, right? Like you're not drafting him to play linebacker. And and a lot of it is because of that right there. I mean, Drew Tranquil is considered to have short arms in the NFL and he's got 31 and a half inch arms. Drew is Drew White sub 31. But athletically though, Drew White compares well to, you know, the movement stuff that Drew Tranquil did. The difference is, is Drew Tranquil had much better explosiveness numbers. He had a 37 and a half inch vertical uh, and he had a and he had a a a 122 inch broad jump. That's a really impressive broad jump. And I think he was like in the top two or three in almost everything except the 40 at at the combine. So uh, and and Drew wasn't Drew White wasn't in that quite in that range in all of the numbers. Just the movements were. So I just want to make sure that we're we're remembering that correctly. It's a it's a little bit of a different animal. A guy that I thought had odd numbers. Like very odd numbers. Ryan's smiling because he knows exactly what I'm going to talk about. Isaiah Pryor had weird numbers, guys. He he checks in at just over six one, and it and and he had a, a two a two hundred twenty pounds. He ran a a four five eight, which was good. You know, ran a four two eight in the pro shuttle, which is solid. And he ran a six seven three in the three cone with twenty four inch or twenty four reps in the bench. And again, we put an asterisk by that reps in the bench because he also had a lot of short arm ones. But then he had a 30 and a half inch vertical jump, but he had a 10 one broad it, it, that vertical jump. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Cause like it doesn't yeah. match with any of the other numbers. Like it made no sense, made no sense to me, Ryan. I'm sorry. It just didn't. 
It was so weird, man. So, I mean, for people that out there that don't know, I, I, um, I actually know the trainer that was working with Isaiah Pryor and he was asking me, you know, Oh, what's, what's the numbers looking like. And I told him a 30 and a half inch vertical. And he just said, he literally just messaged me back. Oof. <laughs> like yeah. literally just said, Oof. Yeah. He's like, that is not what he's been doing in, in, right. um, in, in, in training. And I mean, I, I would, I would believe him, you know, because right. I know so, all the, un, all the other numbers track with a better than a 20, than a 30 and a half inch vert, even the broad t- yep. tracks better than a 30 and a half inch vertical jump. And I, I mean, I'll, I'll say this, man, is Isaiah Pryor is an interesting athlete at 220 pounds. Cause you want to talk about a guy that maybe could be a special team stalwart at the next mm-hmm. level, a guy that maybe dime linebacker on obvious passing downs at 220 plus pounds running four, five, eight, which is a good number and having that 10, one broad, like you said, and that three cone, obviously, I mean, I I didn't quite see quick twitch on tape like that of Isaiah Pryor, but like, obviously there's some quickness in there as well. So Isaiah Six, really seven, helped three, himself. Ryan is smoking. It's buzzing, man. Like it's that's like a cornerback number. That's a really good yeah. corner number. Like that's yeah. not a, a 220 pound safety linebacker right. hybrid. So Isaiah helped himself big time. The 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 vertical was a very weird number. I don't understand exactly how that translated when you take a look at everything else. Mm-hmm. But overall, thought he had a really good day, man. He's going to get a look a little bit because. Right. I mean, those numbers are just going to kind of be like, huh, we're at least going right. to take you into a camp. Like, you're not going to get right. drafted, but like, we'll right. take you into a camp and we'll take a look at. He's not getting drafted. Right? He didn't, he never started for Notre Dame. He was exactly. going to start. No. And Andre Neely said this, Sean. He said, prior stiff. And honestly, that's what I see on film, Sean. And that's really kind of what, what surprised me even more about the movement numbers were, were not what you'd think from a guy that played that stiff in college, Sean. I just, it, it, it didn't make a lot of sense. But to Ryan's point, I mean, you're looking at this guy not for coverage, not for dropping into coverage. You're looking for this guy in that kind of coverage, meaning you're running down and tackling a ball carrier. And he's going to have a lot of highlight reel type plays in, in special team, Sean. Yeah, similar to what I said about Jack Cohn while we were watching. I wish Isaiah Pryor had one more year of coaching here at Notre Dame. Not that the coaching at Ohio State was bad, but sometimes you can be put in a position where you start out in the wrong position at a certain school. And you're referring to more linebacker coaching yeah. because he was a safety at Ohio State. That's what you're – you're yeah. not taking a shot at Ohio State. No. You're just saying no. a specific I just position. want to make sure I'm right. specifying right. when I say, yeah, right. thank you for doing that, clarifying that. I wish he had one more year at Notre mm-hmm. Dame being coached at the linebacker position. And now you see the tape. You know, it will, it will remind me of what we saw from Asmar his mm-hmm. last year at Notre Dame. We didn't expect it. Like it came mm-hmm. out of nowhere – because we thought it was a stiff athlete, he was a stiff athlete that didn't know how to play the game. And then he makes a jump and his film gets much better his senior year. If we had another year of Isaiah Pryor playing this position at Notre Dame, we might have seen the same jump. But unfortunately, he didn't get that. He tests well. He had to be a great athlete. Mm-hmm. You look at his offers coming out of high school. So him testing well as an athlete shouldn't be that shocking. And what shouldn't be shocking is that we know he's stiff on tape. So, right, like you said, but like Ryan said, someone's going to look at those numbers and say, you know what? He's well worth an invite to a right. camp. Right. A, a guy. I'm going to try to say it's a serious face. And we're going to finish with Jack Cohn because he just did workouts. Jack Cohn and Kevin Austin just did workouts. I did not expect Kane Madden to test well. I didn't. Straight faces, guys, because Kane's a good kid. But you're his ma- testing you're, numbers. You're, ma- you're making me laugh. I'm not. I'm trying not to. I'm trying to. Listen, guys. Um, I feel bad for him because he caught a lot of uh, uh, comments from us, Sean and I, especially, especially Sean. Uh, cause Sean pulled the Vince Vaughn erroneous, you know, during the, the, the Thanksgiving special when Sean was just like listening to me and Malik and Reggie talk and Sean was just, and then as soon as somebody was like Kane mad and Sean was like erroneous, erroneous on both counts, uh, he was going off. But, um, I think he caught a lot of flack for our feelings more for the person who chose to play him more so than him. I mean, you know, Kane tried his best, but boy, the, the things that we thought about him just having no athleticism whatsoever showed up today, guys. Uh, his 40-yard dash, he ran a 5.63. He measured in at 
310 pounds with sub 31 inch arms, just really short arms. And, and he had a 75 and an eighth inch wingspan, which is just not good. It's decent. I mean, that's actually decent wingspan considering how short his arms are, you know, cause drew white had similar arm length and he had a 73 and five eighths wingspan. He had a 75. I mean, that's, that's basically comes down to broader shoulders, but he had a 27 inch vertical, which actually wasn't bad considering the other numbers. But five six three, he had a, a three two seven in the twenty, and a one nine six in the ten. He ran a four eight three in the pro shuttle, and a seven eight one in the three cone. And then with those short arms, only did twenty four reps on the bench. You'd think a guy that was like him that had those short arms, you'd I was expecting him to pump up thirty plus reps. I, I felt really, I, I actually felt really bad for Kane. I'm not trying to be serious. I'm not trying to be like sarcastic i'm not trying to take a shot at the kid like that was a i mean any chance he has it at really anybody looking at him is i mean i just he's not even on my camp invite list right now guys i just i mean somebody might because might, he's 310 pounds and played another name but i mean those are that's that's really like unathletic numbers it's what you'd expect from a, a an okay player at marshall right right and i, I mean it's it comes down to it. And it's not the same conversation because often interior offensive line testing is not as important as when I was talking about drew white, but he's, he has no length and he's not athletic. I mean, it's, there's limitations obviously at that point. Right. And just for comparison's sake, 75 and an eighth wingspan was the same as former Notre Dame linebacker and Toledo linebacker, Jonathan Jones, who is at the event today, who is a 5'11 and 5'8 linebacker. Mm-hmm. So he has the same wingspan as a 5'11 And shorter linebacker. arms. Yes. And um, shorter arms. And shorter arms, yeah. So, I mean, look, I mean, the the I think the, the point to it here is that – Kane Madden probably should not have been playing high level football at Notre Dame. Like, let's just call it Mm. what it is, you know? And unfortunately he's going to be now in a, in a hole where he isn't athletic. He's small. He's short arms. He's a hardworking kid. He, Hey man, he was an all American at Marshall, which is awesome. And he'll be able to tell people about that for years to come, but he is not an NFL kid. I just no. don't, I, I mean, that's just the point like period. Could he play in a different developmental league? Could he play in the USFL or XFL? Maybe, but he's just not an NFL kid. That's just the point no. I like about it. And and honestly, he should not have been starting for Notre Dame this year. I just, I mean, you can't have a guy that moves like that playing for you when you're trying to beat, you're trying to run the ball against anyone. And this is, this is exactly what we talked about. Like he just doesn't move. I mean, th- those are, those are plotting numbers, Sean. I know you're trying to hold it back, Sean, but just some, so I think the, the Sean, the big thing for me is I really was surprised by the bench numbers. I really thought that would be the one area because we knew he was going to have short arms. I wasn't expecting 30 and, and eight, you know, or whatever it was, 30 and six eights uh, or to normal people, three quarters, uh, you know, but but only doing 24 reps unless he just did 24 and racked it. You know what I mean? Like, which maybe it was the case. I don't think so. Uh, but uh, man, that was uh that was the so that was a big surprise for me is I just was expecting at least him to show that he's got some strength to him. Tommy did a really good job with the script for Jack today. <laughs> okay. So let's move on to Jack. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say he did a really good job getting 35.8 points per game with him. <laughs> so let's move on to Jack Cohn. Uh Jack. Uh, somebody asked about how he compares to Chris Watt. Chris Watt, who was also definitely on the shorter side of the NFL, had 32 and three quarter inch arms. So well over two inch longer arms, by the way, at 310 pounds. So let's talk about Jack Cohn and Kevin Austin, starting with Jack Cohn. Obviously, Ryan, Jack is a guy that you've been saying really going back to the Shrine Bowl. He was in the Shrine Bowl, correct? Like they're all, they all, you know, all those games. Uh, <laughs> He was a guy that every day during that practice just kept drawing attention from analysts and scouts. And then he had a great game, Shrine Bowl game. Uh, thought he had a really good combine performance with the movement numbers. He threw the ball well. And he, to me, uh, from what you know, you guys say, it sounds like he did nothing but help himself uh, and just continue to build on that strong offseason because he didn't do any testing. Just everybody knows mm-hmm. he just did on field workouts. So, uh, just what did you guys see from Ashana? Uh, we'll let you start since you know you uh, 
you started the Jack Cone conversation. Let's you start with what you saw from Jack during today's workout. Yo. So mean. Jack, I, I got jealous for a minute. And, and what I said by that, or not jealous, I got greedy for a minute. And in the middle of his workout, I think he had three balls drop. Did three balls hit the ground? So he had he had a total. I put it in the article. He had a total of six balls out of fifty-seven hit the ground. Two were dropped out of. Two were dropped, six. right? Yeah. And one was like a bad overthrow to his left. But other than that, beautiful. I mean, the way Tommy orchestrated and set it up, he highlighted. Jack in person has a little bit more zip than I thought. Mm-hmm. On his ball, that's the one thing that jumped out to me. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching him. And I turn to Ryan and I say, "What if this kid, with what he did for Notre Dame, holding things together last year? What if he had Harry Heath stand in this offensive line this year? How many yards would Jack Cone mm-hmm. throw for? Like, I literally thought about. Well, that. Sean, just watch the last three games of the season. Yeah." When he had time to throw and they yeah. had Styles was playing more and Lynn, you know what I mean? Like that's, yeah. he put up over 300, you know, at least 300 yards in each of the last three games. And he mentioned it. He said it's night and day leaving Wisconsin and coming to Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. It's like going yeah. from college to the NFL. That's how he described moving from that offense right. in Wisconsin and coming to Notre Dame. And just like I said with Isaiah Pryor, I just wish he had another year in this system with Tommy Reese, and you probably would have seen him yeah. end up being a – Ryan, you, you can – I don't know how you would see him, maybe sneaking up into the third or fourth round as a quarterback. Well, let, let me ask you this, Ryan, along mm-hmm. Sean's question. Let's yeah. just say that Jack was a senior this year and he was coming back for a fifth year. We're, we're not trying to have the Tyler Buck. This is just this is just about Jack, right? Just about Jack, sure. okay? If he was just a senior and came back for a fifth year in last, next year, and, and to Sean's point, you know, you've got the Harry he's on the line, and he continues what he did second half of the year. What separates Davis Mills and Jack Cohn as prospect? I'm, I'm not saying – I'm not. that's not a setup question. Like, I have an answer. Yeah. I'm honestly asking you, in your opinion, as someone mm-hmm. who who – I believe you were someone who was high on Davis Mills last year, if I remember correctly, going into the draft. I, I and like he ended up being a third-round pick. He was a third-round pick, correct? Yep, beginning what, of the third. What, yep. would, what would separate a Jack Cohn from a Davis Mills in regards to being a guy that, that could be a day two a day two pick with that additional year that Sean talked about? Yeah, I, th- I think when you're comparing those two, I think that Davis has just a little more arm talent. Like, the ball just comes out a little more naturally. It just comes out of his hand a little different, you know. And he, I think he's a little bit better of an athlete as well. But, I mean, to answer Sean's question out of it, Sean, I think he's a, I think he's going to be a drafted. I think he's going to be somewhere 6-7, to seven, somewhere in that ballpark. Could he sneak into earlier into day three? I, it's possible because – I mean, Ian Buck went in the fourth round. So, I mean, you, you can convince me of anything at this point. <laughs> so, I mean, it's possible. It's man. just the petty, it's, petty start of the day, everybody. It, it's not petty. It's not petty. I'm just saying, man, it's not a great quarterback class. And if you told me that Jack Cohn ended up being a fifth round selection in this class, I would say mm-hmm. I, I get it. I understand it because there's just right. not a lot of depth to this class. Right. I just I I would have been really curious, Sean, because to your point, what he's what they're referring to is there's some things that change. Number one. At Notre Dame, he and this was part of this was part of the reason I think Jack at times looked so unathletic, is because his footwork was completely changing at Notre Dame compared to what it was at Wisconsin when he was completely under center. It was a very high play action offense. If you look at the percentage of play action throws compared to normal to, to like the overall attempts at Wisconsin compared to Notre Dame, it was much higher. And a lot of the Notre Dame play actions were the the shotgun just riding it out. I mean, he was at Wisconsin doing bootlegs. You know, doing pure play action where he's you know going back and riding the fake and then setting up and it's downfield shots and all that kind of stuff. It was a completely different type of of footwork, and I think that's also partly why it did take Jack a little bit of time to get super comfortable in the offense once the pass rush started to come. I think he could handle just dropping back and throwing clean and making throws. Well, that's why we saw him so you know please so good against. Uh, against Florida State, but once the pressure came, it's a whole different type of footwork to get out of pressure in the shotgun compared to under center. But to Sean, to your point, as the season went on, Jack looked more and more comfortable. Even in the face of pressure at times, Jack looked 
a perfect example. I don't know if Jack would have had the the ability early in the season to uh, on that blitz that Oklahoma State brought. I don't know if Jack yeah. would have been able to as quickly and cleanly and accurately get that ball off to Chris Tyree. Yeah. That that later in the year because I just he never felt footwork wise he was super comfortable in the pocket. Got better and better and better. And a lot of that's on Tommy Reese. The other reason why he says is night and day difference is we've said this for years. Notre Dame has a pretty complex pass offense. They do. And that's one of the things that attracted to people about Ben Skoranek and the reason that John Von McKinley drew a lot of interest from undrafted people last year. He actually got a pretty decent contract, like one of the bigger undrafted free agent contracts last year, Devon McKinley did, is because there's a lot of NFL teams that look at Notre Dame's past concepts and say, there's a lot to that that we like. It's just at times you didn't have the guys to execute it, either at quarterback or – and this is what we said like in 2020 and 2019. People don't – if you, unless you're at a Notre Dame game, you don't understand how open Notre Dame's players were in the in, in, in 19 and 20. They just never got the ball thrown to them. But they were open, trust me, uh, because the schemes are there. And that's partly why I'm so excited about the future, Sean. And you kind of hit on that is, is you know, it, it, it comes down to – I believe Tommy Reese can teach that better than Brian Kelly could. And at the end of the day, that's going to be the difference. And that's what he credited. That's what he credited with the media. He credited Tommy Reese for bringing him along, developing him, and getting him acclimated to what needed to be done to play at the next level and play at the elite level at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he could have taken time to mention other coaches that are no longer here, but Mm -hmm. he didn't. Say the oh, name, man. Sean. Say oh, the name. no, no. You might as well write it out, buddy. I mean, I don't even put his name in shows any, or in articles anymore. It's the <laughs> former coach. That's all I'm going to say. Brian, uh, can, but, I, can, I, can I read an awesome quote about Jack today that sure. we got? It's, it's going to be in a future piece. This is talking to Kyron Williams. Is this from him or from, Ky- from another? This is from Kyron about okay. Jack Cohn. Okay. So Kyron said, Jack is just a gamer. He really just loves it. He loves it so much that he doesn't want to stop. He wants to keep getting better and get closer to where he wants to be. That's just who Jack is. Jack always shows up. He knows when it's time to go and knows what he has to do. He goes to the East-West Shrine Bowl, and he is the best quarterback, wins the award. Wherever he goes, he leaves his mark. That is something that NFL teams have to see. They have to notice that Jack is an all-around quarterback. He does it in big games, big moments, high-pressure situations from Kyron Williams. I'm going to say something here that you guys may or may not disagree with. You can say if you don't. I'm not taking any credit away from Tommy Reese or Marcus Freeman or 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 or, or uh, Chad Bowden, who have done a phenomenal job recruiting Dante Moore. If Jack Cohn doesn't do what he did in the final three games in that pass offense, it would be a lot harder to get Dante Moore. What he showed down the stretch of the season was you can rip teams in this offense. And, and you know, yeah, you could say, oh, well, Stanford wasn't that good. No, Oklahoma State had one of the 10 best pass defenses in the entire country. They only had one team all season that had over 400 yards of total offense, and that was Oklahoma, had 447 with Caleb Williams. Jack Cohn passed for over 500 yards in that game, right? And so it, whether people want to admit it or not or like it or not, the fact that Jack went and ripped teams up in the second half of the year and, you know, like I said, threw 12 touchdowns in the last four games, uh, Notre Dame averaged 40 points per game in the last four games. He averaged way over 300 yards passing in the last three games and through nine touchdowns just in the last three games alone. Don't think that that wasn't used when they are talking to Dante Moore. I'm telling you, it was. This is what we are supposed to be. And imagine if we, you know, and so, but it was Jack executing that offense because you can't show film of, of another quarterback where, hey, it's open. Now, we didn't throw it, but it's not – but it's open. You need to have film of it working. And Jack hitting the wheel routes and hitting the drags and reading things out and and, and hitting those seams and making those back shoulders, running the RPO. I mean, his, his RPO run, you know game in, late in the season was, was outstanding. You now have film to sit down with Dante Moore and say, that's who we are. And imagine what we could be with you, right? And so we may not, we may not like it, but if Notre Dame is able to get Dante Moore, 
you're 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 going to be able to have to look back and say, yes, Tommy Reese, huge credit. Chad Bowden, huge credit. Marcus Freeman, huge credit. Jack Cohn deserves a little bit of something that too because he showed that it can you can have this offense. You can mm-hmm. be this offense. Uh, so you know that's part of the reason why. And you know what? He never complained. He never bitched. He never, you know, why did I get benched? I shouldn't be benched. You know, he could have gloated after the Virginia Tech game. Well, this is why they never should have taken me out in the first. He never did any of that. When Tyler Buckner replaced him and had success, you'd see it on TV. You'd see it in person. Jack Cohen was the first person to meet Tyler on the sideline. And NFL scouts are going to look at that because if you're looking for a backup quarterback, you want a guy that's going to be a leader and a team player and is going to be like, hey, whatever your my role is, I just want to win. And that's why I think there's going to be a lot of people valuing him a lot more than some people think, because mm-hmm. there's the character aspect of it, but there's also some film to look at. You know, yeah. this kid threw for over 3,000 yards, 25 touchdowns, only through seven picks behind one of the worst offensive lines in Power Five, okay, with receivers that couldn't get off the freaking line of scrimmage half the time. And this kid, this kid still completed 65.5% of his throws, threw for over 3,000 yards, 25 touchdowns, and seven picks. Right. I mean, had an over a 150 quarterback rating. I mean, Jack Cohn, in my opinion, doesn't get the respect that he deserves from Notre Dame faithful for the kind of success that he had. I, I've I've needed to say that, but that's just kind of what I felt about him, because there was only one other quarterback that ever had better passing numbers under the Brian Kelly era. Not since Jimmy Clausen has a quarterback had a better quarterback rating than what Jack Cohn had this year. And that was Ian Book in 2018. And he only started nine games. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have to face Michigan, the best defense they faced all year. Right? So, I mean, I'll just say that. And I think NFL teams are going to see that and be like, that's a kid I want on my football team. Maybe he's not a starter, but that's a kid. And if if we do have to throw him into into a, a moment like Notre Dame did against Virginia Tech, you know, like Notre Dame did against Toledo, we do have to throw him in there off off the bench, and he's got to lead us to two touch. Remember, Virginia Tech game, Jack had to score twice to win that game. Not only that, he had to throw a two point conversion. They had to get a two point conversion to tie it. Mm-hmm. So um, that's why I was. I feel like Jack deserves more love and credit from Notre Dame fans. Well, and he. He has the credit from the NFL. I'll tell you that very much. I keep that. This is why I keep reiterating it. I would be surprised at this point if Jack Cohn is not drafted. Like that's just fl- flat out what it is. And I would add to this, Brian. If I mean, I went to the Cincinnati game, right? And it was disastrous from a quarterback playing pers- pers- perspective. And I thought that was beginning of the end of Jack Cohn. I'll be very honest. I, and it could a lot of quarterbacks would have just stayed down and been like, "Oh man, poor me." But I will give Jack Cohn all the credit in the world. He played his best football in the most adverse situation, and he came yeah. out on the other side. So yeah. if you want to talk about a guy that can make it, we've talked about the make it mentality at the at the next level, a guy that just has something to him, Jack Cohn has it. He does. Right. I, like, well, he is going to work. And I think this, that, that that quote from Kyra Williams kind of is that. And so does this moment. You know, the, the, the right before he throws a game winning touchdown pass, they got to snap his finger back into place and he runs right back out and throws a game winning touchdown. So, uh, anyway, that's that's enough about Jack. Uh, he th- was thrown to Kyron Williams today, guys. Obviously, Kyron had a phenomenal combine, so uh, he would have been, in my Kevin opinion, Austin. Full- Kevin Austin. Kevin what Austin. did I say? Kyron Williams. Kyron Williams. Williams. Kevin Austin had a phenomenal combine performance. Uh, I, I think he'd have been foolish to work out today. I mean, he could only hurt himself. Uh, workout meaning testing, but he worked out. He was there the whole time, which I thought was cool. He was there the whole time with his teammates, uh, which I thought was awesome. But then he obviously works out. How did he do? How did he look? You know, was he running around good? How did he catch the ball, guys? How did uh, how did Kevin Austin look? Sean, let's start with let's start with you on this one. Effortless, literally effortless. Mm-hmm. And once again, this is going to continue to trend. Gosh darn it! <laughs> I wish <laughs> Fancy Stucky could get his hands on this kid. Like it was once again, yeah. it was like with him, Jack. It's like, man, I wish we had these guys one more year with mm-hmm. this coaching staff because you can see the athletic ability. The up, up, the athletic ability in person is just amazing. Mm-hmm. He just runs effortlessly. So, you like, you watch the 40 and you're like, we didn't see that on tape. Like, what the heck is going yeah. on? But then you watch him in person, you're like, yeah, he's moving. Yeah, like he's moving and this it's effortless. You could see it on tape when he wasn't getting jammed. Yes. Now, see, that that's the thing. 
There's one thing you can see. You watch his feet and you watch Kyron's feet at the beginning of the route. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay. And it's obvious that the NFL, because he was honest enough when he was asked about what teams are telling him or what they told him at the combine. And he said, most teams told him, we want you to come in, be a part of special teams and let us develop you until what we think you can become. Mm -hmm. That's the way NFL teams are looking at him. Mm -hmm. He knows that going in, he has an expectation of where he thinks he's going to be. I think Ryan, I think you said about third or fourth round when we were talking on the sidelines. Yep, I think so. Kevin yep. Austin. So if you can pick up a kid like that in a deep wide receiver class, you can get a quality kid like that. There was one team that was eyeing him and Jack. Like he was the only coach that was literally right behind Jack the entire time. And he kept looking out at Kevin Austin every time he took a rep. And it was the, the individual that was there for the Titans. The Titans had their eye on Jack Cohn, and they had their eye on Kevin Austin like Hawks the entire workout. So maybe because I think they just got the, Julio Jones, they let He's go of him. Right. They got released. And they so like he, bigger receivers too. They, they like, like big, big kids who can run. Yeah, so yeah, maybe yeah. he can come in, learn special teams by year two, year three, be a very productive receiver. And Tannehill is very similar to mm -hmm. – Jack Conus, he's a little bit more athletic, of course. Right. But you talk about arm talent and the oh, way he throw. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, guy played wide receiver for Texas A&M. I mean, yeah. Jack ain't out there lining up at the W like, throw me the rock. Yeah. You know, right. exactly. Tannehill, was, Tannehill was a good wide receiver, he too. Was. He, was yeah, he, was. Receiver. Yeah, he was. He was. But it goes to what we've been saying. Jack deserves a lot more credit. And then watching Kevin Austin run, it's easy to see how teams can fall in love with the athletic ability. He mm -hmm. had two drops back to back. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. Like he was locked in. He was catching. He was catching balls like over his head, all hands behind him. He was having a mm -hmm. fabulous workout. And then almost towards the end, he had back to back drops. Then he gathered, regathered himself, mm -hmm. got back on track, had a phenomenal catch to end it on a uh, post route. Look, the reality with Kevin Austin, guys, is you're taking a flyer on him a little bit because there's one year production. Yeah. yeah. You've got the injury history. You've got the suspension. You've got the, I mean, he had some awful drops. I mean, just like wide open, big yeah. moment, just some really bad drops. And even his one year production was good. It wasn't great. You know, it's not like he had a thousand yards. He had 48 catches. When was it, was it 48 or 42? 40, I forget how many, he had 49 catches, I think it was, for 888 yards, you know, ranked 18th in the country in production, uh, but, you know, just wasn't wasn't that guy that, in my opinion, was like, wow, that that those numbers are going to completely over overturn everything. It's 48 catches for, for 888 yards and seven touchdowns. So, you know, that that's the thing is somebody's going to have to take a little bit of a – he's going to have to be a guy that if you take in the third or fourth round, you're kind of – a little bit. I'm, I'm just being honest. The ten, but the ten, and the reason you're taking that risk is because the talent is talent obvious. Is it's just can he put it all together? Can he run routes? You know, he's my issue with with Kevin is sometimes he sounds like a guy that doesn't have a realistic view of who he actually is. Like he's talking. I've heard him talk about how good of a route runner he is and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, that, that changed, didn't show up on film. That changed you know? today. Yeah, that changed today when he was talking to the media. I think hearing feedback from the nfl mm -hmm. kind of pulled the reins on okay him. so what was he saying today about that sean well he like i said he found out from the nfl how yeah. they view him and then he went on to talk about how he needs to get better okay at running routes and his footwork and i think yeah. now he gets yeah. it like because at the combine he was talking like you know i'm a good route runner he even yeah. recently had an interview somewhat recently and he was talking about how he's a really good route runner i'm just like Oh, yeah, man. that that wasn't his tune when he met with the okay. media. Today. That's good. That's a good sign. And I was like, I don't know who's gotten to him. Yeah, but he's gotten the message, and he's willing to put in the work. That's and good. that was his. That was really what he was saying. Like, I'm willing to put in the work to do whatever I have to do to get to the level I want to play at All at right. the next level. And he's understanding now that when he comes in, he's probably coming in as a special teams guy to work himself up and develop mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. into a productive receiver. That's the mm -hmm. guy 
that talk to the media today. So yeah. hopefully, yeah, hopefully he's ready to put in that work. But like you said, the talent is immense. Yeah. The talent is first round. The talent. I mean, that's something round. Ryan and I have discussed. Film, I mean, I, I just the film is first round. This is something else somebody asked, and I think he kind of avoided the question. Someone asked, how did his injuries play into his performance? I don't think it did. Year. I don't think it did. And, and let, let me explain that. So, number one, I think the athleticism and the size and that stuff is, is round one talent. And, and mm -hmm. that's the thing that I would say. I don't think his football talent is necessarily a oh, first-round no. player. No, no, I think he's got the size, the athleticism. Like, those things to me are first-round talent. He needed Absolutely. to come back because he needed to prove that he could be actually a first-round football player, not just a first-round athlete. Right. And I think that's kind of the, the bigger thing for me is, is he needed to prove that. But the common misconception is that he missed two years of football. He did not miss two years of football. He missed one. And it was the injury year. The year he was suspended in 2019, he was with the team the whole year. He practiced every day. He never right. missed time yeah. unless he had like a little minor injury. He was in, he was on the team. So he got coached or well to the level that that they did. Uh, you know, but it was just one of those things where you look at it and say, it just wasn't, he just he just wasn't coached. That's what hurt him. What hurt Kevin Austin was he wasn't coached. He and he needed to be. Like Lorenzo Styles showed up mm -hmm. knowing how to play football to a degree. Kevin Austin just dominated right. private school league in Southern Florida, in Florida and yeah. just was a great athlete. He never knew how to play football. I mean, even if you go back to his first year against Michigan, you know, he played in the first game and they put him in and threw a deep shot to him. Even then, he didn't know how to get off the line then, and it never got better because I don't think he was coached to get better. I think it's not that he doesn't want to, and I think I think at times Kevin was not pushed. Del, I think Coach Alexander just was I don't know unwilling to challenge Kevin to be better. Like he needed a Harry Heastan type of coach at receiver, a guy that's just going to be on him all the time about no, 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 no. You can be great, and if you don't give me great today, I'm not going to be happy. And Kevin didn't get that. Never yeah. got that. I think that's the issue, and that's why I'm like, if you're willing to take a chance on this kid, as long as the character checks out for you as a team, I'm taking a flyer on this kid. Uh, maybe round three, but definitely round four or five, because the physical tools are outstanding. If you have a, if you have, if you believe you're a team that is that actually cares about development, because some NFL teams don't care. Some NFL teams are like, look, we're, I don't want to have a guy that I have to baby and coach up and do all this kind. Of, I just want a guy that can come in and play. Some teams are like that. I mean, Ryan, you know that. Some teams are more willing to take a flyer on a kid like that and say, hey, look, you know, we can coach this guy up for a year, put him on special teams, let him run down on kickoffs, but then we can work him on how to play receiver. This kid can help us down the road. And and so to me, if you have a team that has a receiver's coach, it's like, man, I can, yes, please, please give me this kid. Then, yeah, this kid has a chance to someday be a really good football player. And that's why I always said all along, he's the one guy that I look at of all the guys that, that went out. He was the one guy that, to me, made the biggest mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, Kyron should have come out. You know, I know it's not working out yeah. well for him right now, but he wasn't going to be a four, four, five next year. You know, Kyron is who he is athletically. I mean, Kyron's game is what it is. He's not going to come back and get better, in my opinion. Uh, Kyron, Kyron Hamilton, no question he had to go. But Kevin was a guy that I thought needed to come back. I understand why he didn't. I mean, he didn't know who he was going to be playing for, right? I mean, it's just I don't blame him. But he's the one that, to me, really – because, like you said, Sean – Imagine what his numbers were this year with the line they had and the poor coaching he had. What his numbers could have been like next year. Now that Lorenzo's a sophomore, Mayer's yeah. a junior, you know, the offense is going to be better. The line will be better. I just really felt like Kevin Austin could have been a. He could have had. I mean, somebody just said it, um, you know, it, or, you know, somebody said it like in a negative way, talking about he's not Claypool. Yeah, he could have been. You know, he could have been. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, th that's the thing is like. Kevin Austin's senior year at Notre Dame. I'm just going. I'm going to give you the numbers. Kevin Austin's senior year at Notre Dame. He had 48 catches for 888 yards and seven touchdowns. In Chase Claypool's senior year, right? Because Chase was part of the 16, 17, 18. Chase Claypool senior year, he had monster numbers, right? Chase had 66 yards for 1,037, right? 13 touchdowns. He only had 160 some more yards than 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 Kevin Austin had. He only had 18 more catches, and Chase had been in the rotation his whole time. To me, if you look at like Chase's numbers, the first time Chase was like a full-time starter 
right, which was actually 2018 outside, Chase had 50 catches for 639 yards and four touchdowns, right? So so don't tell me Kevin couldn't have come back next year and been a monster. He could have. And, you know, his testing numbers too, Ryan, he, t- he checked out with a 70 th- with 33 and an 8-inch arm length for receiver and a 79 and 6-8-inch, almost an 80-inch wingspan for wide mm-hmm. receiver. That's that catch radius that we talk about. Yep. You know, so that's a pretty good catch radius. So, yes, I do think Kevin Austin, if he could have come back and put in the work, um, could have could have been a guy that made big jumps up pe- people's draft board. And just to put it in context, that question came after he was talking about what he brings to the game. And he was talking about needing to get better route running. He also mentioned, you know, being elite in his mind at going up and getting the ball in the air which you just talked about with his wingspan. Mm-hmm. So I think but he wasn't, that's my, that's always been my issue with Kevin. Yeah. And I, and I, I must say this, Sean, let me interject here. This is a comes, goes all the way back to when he was in high school. Mm-hmm. He was at one of the rivals camps in, I think it was Indianapolis. And I was, cause I was with rivals at the time and he was just, he was getting whooped at the line. And I went up to him and I was like, you know, he was a couple things you may want to give it a whirl. And it just was like, <laughs> in one year out the other. No, I got this. I'm good. Like Kevin's always had this thought that he's fine. And that's that's kind of been my issue with him is, you know, great receivers. We talk about great receivers are master craftsmen. We've talked about this. Look at the best receivers in the NFL, and none of them just get by on talent. None of them, because those guys don't make plays. The best receivers in the league are craftsmen. Kevin has to learn that. And until he does, I always wonder just what kind of of like, is he really going to totally buy into the fact that, dude, you are starting from ground zero? Like, do you understand that? You're at ground zero from a technical standpoint. And you need to get to at least seven to be serviceable, you know? And that's that's my question, right? I mean, Ryan, you, you tell me. I mean, you, you, you're, yeah. you're the draft guy. You tell me. How far is his game? Uh, yeah, not talent, just his game from being the other day one, day two receivers. Man. All right. So here's the issue with Kevin Austin. We saw today, Sean, I thought he had great hip sync, came in and out of breaks, caught everything consistently. I mean, I mean, he's standing next to me. I'm just, I felt terrible about myself. I'm just like, wow, mm-hmm. that people can look like that. That's insane. You know, <laughs> I need to get to the gym. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, the issue though is, is that he might have first round or let's just call a top 50 look to him and talent mm-hmm. level, but he's got seventh round UDFA film. Like, I right. mean, for being very honest, right. he put up production in college just because he's such a good athlete, but his releases aren't good. He doesn't win consistently at the catch point. He's not a good route runner right now on film. So the guy that we get on film is not the same player that I saw today with, with Kevin Austin. Right now, the hope is, is that those guys meet at some point. Like, and I hope they do because Kevin Austin is a phenomenal talent. There is no question, Right, but the make it or break it to being that top 50 type of player and early round wide receiver a lot is what Brian's talking about a little bit. It's that there's a, there's a, there's a characteristic of cop the competitive fire that we will Mm -hmm. talk about a lot. I, I, I boasted about Kyron Williams earlier in this show. Kyron Williams is the player he is because of how he attacks everything that he does. Kevin seems to be attacking everything right now. You know, he went to Exos and he, put up these insane numbers and he looked really good in this workout today. Is that going to continue? I think it's a real concern. I hope it is because I will always root for Kevin Austin because he's a former Mm -hmm. Notre Dame player and the fan in me will always root for that young man because he's a fantastic talent. But right now he is not anywhere near that talent, but he is in my opinion, going to be a third to fourth round player. He could be a top 100 player in this class just simply based upon the traits that he has from there. It's very dependent on the person that Kevin is. He will either get, he's going to get drafted high, in my opinion, third or fourth round. I think he is, despite his film not being great. From there, is Kevin Austin going to be a three year pro because he just doesn't quite have it? Or is Mm -hmm. he going to be a 10 year, 10 year producer at the next level? That is where that separation comes in. Because the talent is there for him to be the latter, Ryan. Yep. And that's, that's why I say teams are taking a risk. You don't know which one you're going to get. And if Kev, if the light mentally goes on for him, Sean, I, I you know, the kid's got a chance to be in my every bit as good as Chase Claypool. Because because Chase Claypool's having the same problem right now. 
That's why Chase wasn't as good in year two as he was in year one. Because Chase, I don't know if he has that, like, Chase. Well, Chase was just learning, self-admittedly, when he got to the league. Correct. Technique. But he said in, that. in year two, Chase struck me as someone who had an interest in things other than, like, does anyone think Cooper Cup and Devontae Adams are doing anything other than just out there running routes every single day? where Chase is out getting in bar fights. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the concern. Like, how hungry are you to become that master craftsman? And the problem with guys like Kevin and Chase is they're so talented that they've been able to just kind of get by with just being talented their whole careers. And that doesn't fly in the NFL. It just doesn't. And, and that's the t- the thing to me uh, that that I often wonder is, is if you have that dog in you, then you're going to put in the work. And I just really right. haven't felt that about a lot of the Notre Dame receivers. I didn't feel that about Miles Boykin. I didn't feel that about, and I especially didn't feel that about Chase and Kevin, where they're going to be guys that just are like, man, I just, I want to do nothing other than just perfecting my craft. And if those two kids can have some a growth and maturity, then there's no doubt in five years, we're talking about how Notre Dame's got a couple receivers if not, you know, we can get into Lorenzo Styles and some other guys that may come down the pike. Well, Notre Dame's got some receivers in the NFL now. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's it's all going to be – it's up to them. And that's the thing. Is it's a, Like, we're talking about, like, Drew White just needs a chance because he's a great kid and he's going to try hard, but he just doesn't have the tools, right? And yeah. it's like – I always kind of like, you know, Kurt Heinish. I, I always wonder, like, what does Kurt Heinish and Drew White think about guys like Kevin Austin and Chase Claypool, right? Like – you know fair what I mean? Point. Like, fair point, dude. If fair. I had your God-given ability, like, yeah, I'd be a top fifteen NFL draft pick. And I think that's the hesitation. And I could be correct me if I'm wrong, right? That's what I think your hesitation is about. You, th- when I say I think he's a first-round talent, what I'm referring to, and what I was saying when you were fixing your curtains, is when I'm talking about talent, I'm talking six two two ten. I'm talking yep. four four three. I'm talking wingspan. I'm talking the physical tools as a mm-hmm. wide receiver. To your point. If I'm just looking at the the receiver talent, he's a late round pick to undraft. Well, let's be honest, yep. his film is that of an undrafted guy. I mean, no it's just flat out the, yep. the the course of his career. Me mm-hmm. in regards to his receiver skills, like mm-hmm. you say, he's, he's got he's he's he, he's really good at contested catches. He made like what two contested catches his whole career, right? Right. He had the catch against Purdue and the tremendous two point conversion catch against Virginia Tech. I mean, that was a phenomenal catch. Other than that. What's the film that shows me you're a great one-on-one guy? Look, man, it's, it's very, it's very simple here. It's very simple. I I find it so funny every time people are like, Oh, how does that team draft so poorly? It's because it's not about evaluation of talents, evaluation of people. (laughs) Like you're evaluating people, man. The the person fails, not the athletes. (laughs) The person fails. It's the attitude. There's teachables and there's unteachables, Brian. You're talking about unteachables, the mm-hmm. size, speed. You can't teach that stuff. The teachables is the better parts of the craft, right? And we're talking about wide receiver, beating press coverage, working in your stem, getting in and out of breaks, hinks, uh, hip sync, all that good stuff, good hand-eye coordination. Like Those things are things that you can improve at. But there's a middle part to that where do you want to be taught that? Right. Like that's the that's the difference there. There's unteachables, teachables, and then there is a middle ground. This right. isn't just a big separation. And that's why people fail. That's why right. guys fail. That's why you can't predict. Because at the end of the day, this game is and that's why I fight back against analytics in the scouting side of things a lot. I'm not evaluating numbers. I'm not. Right. I'm ev- I'm evaluating players. I'm evaluating people. People are successful. And that is the that is their that is why they are successful, or that is why they're downfall more often right. than not. It's the it's the drive that players right. Have. And, and the analytics problem is they only evaluate what happens on the field. And my whole point is, is what the analytics misses. And this is true in baseball and basketball and football is you're missing what go when it comes from a draft standpoint, you're missing. Like when we look at Cooper cup and Devonte Adams, right? Neither of those guys are freaky athletes. Either of them. I mean, Cooper cup ran a four, six, two. I mean, he was a good, I mean, don't, don't get it twisted. Cooper cuts out. Cooper cup is athletic. Devonte Adams is athletic. They just aren't fast. There's a there's a difference. Uh, but the point is, is what you can't evaluate, and the reason that neither of those guys were, I mean, first round picks, despite really excellent college careers, 
is because you can't you can't look at what goes into it. Devontae Adams ran a four five six, ran a four three in the twenty yard shuttle, did fourteen reps on the bench. I mean, he had good explosive numbers, thirty nine and a half inch vertical. That's good. You know, good broad one twenty three six eight two three cones, pretty good. Ran a four five six, so he gets drafted second round twentieth overall of of the second round, twentieth pick of the second round, which would have been like what fifty two overall. The reason why is because you don't, you can't measure to your point what leads him to being such a better player than maybe the guys that were way more, you know, more physically talented in that draft that went ahead of him. And same with Cooper Cup, same with Jerry Rice, right? That's always the stories. The analytics can't measure what that guy's doing on Tuesday in the middle of June when nobody's watching. And that is always going to be my concern with Chase Claypool. That's always going to be my concern with Kevin Austin. And if that light goes on, both of those guys have a chance to be excellent football players in the NFL. And I mean that. I really believe Kevin Austin, if if he can go to a team that's got a receivers coach that can reach him. Sean, you and I know this because we've both worked in ministry, right? It doesn't matter what your knowledge is of your subject that you're trying to teach. You have to find a way to, on a on a personal and emotional level, connect with that young man then the teaching follows. If the, he can go to a team with a receivers coach that can connect with him personally, then coach him, I believe Kevin Austin can be a multi-year thousand-yard receiver in the NFL. I truly believe that. It's just about whether or not he's willing to, to do the work. I, that, that's just my that's my whole thing. And it's the same thing with Chase Claypool. Same thing with Chase Claypool. If Chase Claypool wants to be one of the 10 best receivers in the NFL, I think he's got the God-given talent to be that. You know, or at least in that conversation. And that's saying a lot because there's a lot of really good receivers in the NFL. But he's got things that I don't care how much Cooper Cup and Devontae Adams work in the offseason. There's things they can never do that, that Chase Claypool can physically do. They can't be 6'4". They can't with 6'4 with 4'4", 3 speed and super long arms. They just – Devontae Adams will never no, – he can do all the stretching routines that he wants. He's never going to be 6'4 and 225 and running like Chase runs. But he's a master craftsman, and Chase isn't. And if Chase, if the light goes on for Chase, and if the light goes on for Kevin as people, then they can be excellent football players. Anything you guys want to add to that before we get out of here? Because we are going to dinner here. We're going to have our first staff meeting tonight of everybody in person. So we're going to go get some wings here pretty soon. Uh, anything you guys want to add before we get out of here, Sean? We'll we'll start with you. If there's anything from today, or we, you can talk about whatever the wrap up of what we just talked about, or anything else. Yeah, final takeaways from from the show and from from what we talked about earlier. My real quick, we take- we do have a super real quick. We have super chat from K Grant, a little gift for the five hour show coming up. Message board Intel joke. I'll share that with you guys here in a little bit because you guys were busy working today, so you may not get that. But it has to do with a certain five star quarterback. Uh, so uh, just want to get that in there. But thank you, K Grant, for that. But Sean, sorry, buddy. Wrap up. You, it's all. It's all. Yeah, yeah, my take from it was the atmosphere. That's what I pulled from it. I have my first pro day, and I can only see it getting better in the years to come. And I look forward to being around. But it was great seeing Marcus Freeman and the coaches out there supporting. Chris O'Leary was out there from, like, the very beginning. And his safety showed up first on the upper deck, and he was talking to them and, and pointing certain things out to them and, and teaching and coming over there and saying, yeah, make sure you do this and make sure you do that. And then everybody else showed up, and then you had former players. And by the time you looked up, it was just almost like a big family reunion, more than a pro day. And I think that's an atmosphere that's coming because of Marcus Freeman and what he's establishing. And once again, we had evidence of things are new at Notre Dame and things are enhanced in Notre Dame. And it only goes up from here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to experiencing it next year. I'm already excited. Ryan and I were talking about 40 times we're going to see next year with the guys that are going to be showing up next year to run. And, yeah, that's it. That was my takeaway, just the family atmosphere. I always talked about the brotherhood in Notre Dame is different. And it's hard for people to understand that. But you definitely saw not only the brotherhood, but it felt like one big family today. And it was a great, great thing to be a part of. So before we kick it over to Ryan, Sean, uh, Terry Washburn's questioning your reaction to me talking about us going out and getting wings, man. He no, says you didn't man, look too excited not, about the wings. I'm not feeling wings, man. I'm looking, I'm thinking like dry aged, 16 ounce. The only problem is those places don't have the TVs that I need to watch. Oh, games 
So okay, that's why okay. we're getting wings. I see. And, and, and you probably need a, you probably need a reservation for those types of places as well. But yes. you know, yes. You know. You're forgetting what tonight is about, Sean. It's not about the best possible place to eat. It's about where we can go hang out and watch games and talk about things. So, who, who uh, are you looking for? Do you, do you sound I don't like care. You? I just oh. want to watch games. I just okay. like good games. I mean, I just like good tournament games. Beast Daniel, let me buy a round for you guys tonight. Appreciate that, Beast, very, very, very much. Appreciate y'all very much. So, Ryan, let you let you wrap things up here with uh, just overall impressions, whatever your main takeaway, whatever you want to discuss here, uh, wrap us sure. up here. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a great event, but I, I want to take a second and do something that I don't usually do. And I just want to thank everybody real quick about this because I've been to many pro days at this point. And, um, you know, it, this isn't my first pro day like Sean, for instance, but this was my first pro day at Notre Dame. And just kind of looking back to a second, because at the heart of everything, I am a fan of Notre Dame football and have been a fan my entire life. Like this is something that I absolutely love. And I want to genuinely just thank everybody out there on the message board. I want to thank everybody that's in this chat right now. I want to thank everybody that has sent positive feedback to not, not just me, but anybody on the site. And I want to thank Brian and Irish breakdown for allowing me to live out a dream. I had my dad text me earlier and was like, dude, I am so proud of you. And I'm just like, that is, that's the stuff right there, man. Like, and that's, it's it's been a whirlwind. It's been it's moving fast, and it's always going to move fast. But I just really want to just send my deepest appreciation to everybody out there because this was this was a true uh, this was truly living a dream today a little bit being able to cover Notre Dame Pro Day. It, it was it was awesome, and I thank you all so much for it. Well, you're here because you've earned it. That's that, that's the reality of it. So I appreciate I appreciate appreciate both you guys. But hey, that's going to be it for our pro day wrap up. I got to get dressed because I'm a little further away from the wing place than these guys are. So we're going to we're going to wrap things up and I got to make sure my wife's OK and my dogs are OK and I'm going to get out of here. So everybody, thank you so much for being with us on both of the shows today. There were a ton of fun. Ryan and Sean, great job today, guys. It was a lot of fun. Great conversation, great analysis. Go to the message boards, boards at irishbreakdown.com. We'll still be on there tonight talking about things. Uh, there's some obviously some recruiting intel. Sean's had some stuff last night. Keon Keeley just tweeted out a picture of himself with his whole family in or with the Reader family, which is a teammate of his who's now uh, going to be at Notre Dame. The Reader family. Uh, he is in Chicago tonight. He will be on campus in Notre Dame tomorrow. And tomorrow, guys, make sure you hit the like button, hit that subscribe button because tomorrow we're going to have a post practice show because Ryan. Ryan and Sean are both going to be at tomorrow's practice with Vince. So we might have like four squares in here, It'll be like Hollywood squares tomorrow, baby. Uh, we might have everybody in there talking about, um, about tomorrow's practice. So it'll be first chance for us to see that everyone to see this team in full pad. So it'll be a lot of fun. So make sure you stay locked in for that as well. So uh, for Sean and Ryan, I'm Brian. You all have a great rest of your day. And thank you so much for being with us on the Irish breakdown podcast. <laughs>